So you want me to film you? Dude, what the fuck? Hello? Hello? Oh, fuck. Throw your precious minutes and money away, parasocial audience. Support the channel. Sweatshops are expensive. Whenever the topic of my videos comes up in conversation, people always ask me, Who the fuck are you and why are you digging through my garbage like John Safran at Ray Martin's house? But really, I wish they'd ask me, Fuckstank, what's your process for making videos? How did you get started? Why do you inflict this garbage on other people like this? And I'd tell them, that's a great question, rhetorical person who isn't currently calling the police on me for trespassing in their wheelie bin. Let me show you. As a side note, I'm not legally allowed to pilfer through my neighbor's bins anymore, and there's still some ongoing dispute as to whether or not I ever was. So I've received counsel to advise you all to subscribe to both this channel and my coffee page, because as it turns out, bail posting is really expensive. Metal Gear. By the time 1996 rolled around, Metal Gear was far from Kojima's only IP. While they wouldn't be as well known in the West, with Police Knots lacking an official localization even to this day, his success with Police Knots and Snatcher was enough for Konami to hand him the reins of their flagship title on the upcoming PlayStation. It was the perfect opportunity for him to make a new Metal Gear, something he'd apparently been thinking of doing basically since he finished making the second game. Part of his desire to go back to Metal Gear was nostalgia, having commented in interviews that he liked Metal Gear a lot with the title holding sentimentality for him as the first game he released with Konami. Another part was that, now that he had access to hardware that could create a 3D environment, he could also create some of the scenarios that he had envisioned for the first Metal Gear games, but was unable to make due to the limitations of the MSX. This leads to the first of a couple of things that were clearly important to Kojima when setting out to make Metal Gear Solid. That being, whatever he couldn't do for the first two Metal Gear games due to limitations would inform the design for this one. This extended not just to the stuff he couldn't do at all, but also mechanics and gameplay elements that he thought couldn't be fully realized at the time. In trying to avoid what might be trappings of the action games of old, however, he didn't want players just blitzing through for the sake of points or beating a list of levels. That's obviously what the VR missions were for. This meant that the second thing that seemed to be paramount, at least from the way he talks about it in interviews at the time, is the cinematic feel and presentation of the game. This wasn't just in the way that camera and lighting were used, though he does talk about those quite a bit in interviews around the time as well. It's also about how the game's narrative was presented. This wasn't just gonna be some ham-phoned arcade game, or your standard RPG with a fisted-in story. No oh, way. This was something new for games. Kojima said he wanted players to feel a sense of empathy with Snake, and identify with him the way you would with almost any action star, and really take in the story that he was trying to present. In Kojima's mind, Snake would be a badass, a, you know, cool action hero guy, the kind that fucks all the explosions and doesn't look back at women. Remember when I mentioned that Snake's physique was supposed to be some nightmare combination of Christopher Walken and Jean-Claude Van Damme? That wasn't just regurgitating something you'll read in some wiki. It was a specific instruction that Kojima gave to Shin-Chan regarding Snake's design. He wanted that. And of course, in these early days, there were there were a few things that got mentioned and were obviously changed along the way. For instance, in one interview, Kojima specifically referred to how this would be a story about Snake facing down the unit that he used to belong to, implying some kind of conflict of loyalties for Snake and a more personal history between him and the sons of Big Boss than what actually ended up in the game. Another example would be how this particular group of operatives weren't Foxhound, but Fox Hunt, or that they were specifically a unit called the Space Seals. No, I'm not kidding. That name must 
have been a late hour removal because it's even referenced in the official mission handbook three times. That's a little weird, right? I mean, apparently the only other mention of Space Seals is in the game's novelization, written by a guy who appears to largely only do Bond novels. <sighs> I'll check it out, I guess. Not right now, but I'll see what it's all about. Also, just as a weird point of interest, there's one 1997 interview where it suggested that, at one point, the Nintendo 64 was in consideration for a port of the game. As noted by Kojima, however, it's certainly possible, but the colours and textures would change dramatically. Which is really just a diplomatic way of saying it would look like fucking garbage. You know, throughout these interviews, the obvious comparison that was made before Metal Gear Solid's release was to Resident Evil. You know, because people in the 1990s were fucking stupid. In reality, it's likely because it's the only other game in common memory at the time that would be compared for visuals, especially because of Resident Evil's use of fixed camera angles, giving it a more cinematic look. <laughs> and I mean, really, who the fuck had even heard of Alone in the Dark? <laughs> I bring this up because unlike Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil 2 did see a port to the Nintendo 64. You know, Resident Evil 2, one of the greatest games of its era that defines survival horror and remains a beloved classic to this day. Let's see how it looked on the N64. It's, it's really not that bad, actually. There were some things that he wanted to say with this narrative, though. It wasn't just going to be a hollow action flick imitation without a message. The horrors of war and nuclear weaponry were already prevalent in the first two games and would be again here. However, like the gameplay and visual elements from earlier, this new format allowed him to expound upon those same themes in more meaningful ways. Both concepts take center stage in the narrative of Metal Gear Solid and are given the seriousness that they're due, I think. Most of the time anyway, which I think is kind of the problem, and one even Kojima highlighted. This was a video game, but more specifically, it was a video game in 1998, which meant it still had to be traditionally fun or it wouldn't sell. And the idea of sacrificing fun for art is something that wouldn't be accomplished by a video game until 1996's The Neverhood. The juxtaposition of video gamey fun against serious themes of war is something that, I've been told, can be done and done well, but it kind of has to be handled delicately, because otherwise it just steps right over into camp territory, and well, you enjoy the killing. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. In the meantime, I'm gonna need a quick change of scenery for the next bit. Are you familiar with Big Chungus? Big Chungus. <laughs> No, it's okay. I know it looks a bit shabby, but you can come in. It's fine. I don't think you'll catch anything. When I first started this series, I was between jobs, as it were, which is really just a nice way of saying, don't go into the games industry unless you're absolutely certain of your indispensability, as the people in charge literally could not give a single halfpenny fuck about you otherwise. So, while I'm sitting at my home office desk, drunk and high and barely capable of a single conscious thought, the kids call it crossfading, but I don't see a point in naming such a mundane nightly routine, I drifted into the memories of my younger teenage years. You know, where things Things were still kind of fucked and the stress was constant, but because the problems mostly seem trivial to you now as an adult, you chortle at the perceived naivety because you're incapable of being even remotely gentle with yourself, and in those magical early years of adolescence where people start developing an actual personality, I instead filled my time with video games, and Snake Eater is an absolute standout. The name's Eva. You know, in retrospect, that explains a lot. See, Snake Eater was probably about the time I began to crystallize exactly what it was I love about the series, and maybe even video games in general. It was weird as fuck. And I mean, sure, Metal Gear Solid is weird now in hindsight, but I can't stress enough that the 90s was just a different kind of time. One where a cyborg ninja can be introduced in the middle of an action spy thriller apropos of nothing, and it would never be questioned. For a younger version of myself, Metal Gear Solid was just flat out, faultlessly cool, because it was. Snake Eater though is where Kojima really began to blur the line between movies and games, which is something I'll get into in more detail another day, but that was something completely new to me back then, and Kojima used this blend media format to present some of the strangest goddamn shit I had ever seen in a video game up to that point. I'm talking about shit like this, <laughs> and this, 
And this. And again, just like all of these. And it had the first games available for you to play as well. You know, the real ones, which for many in the West would be the first time they get to play Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Of course, I gave them a crack then, and I think I made it about as far as here for Metal Gear, and here for Metal Gear 2, before giving them away and deciding I'd come back for them later, which I would, 17 years later. Snapping back to my fun employment reality in the dreary times of 2021, I picked up the GOG PC version of Metal Gear and started playing and I mean you've seen it make it on the MSX which doesn't handle scr no I mean like you've already seen it we don't need to watch it again fuck me that audio sucks with a game like this it's hard not to just start cracking jokes like you're watching a terrible movie which is pretty much what I started doing of course months without a job and long stretches of solitude meant the only person I was amusing with my comments in an empty room was myself and possibly the cats I'm not sure they've stopped talking to me by that point and so I started writing them down in an effort to prove I wasn't just losing my marbles I wasn't talking to myself Myself, I was workshopping. And you might have noticed that those first few episodes didn't really have much of the, um, you know. Where does Snake end and where do I begin? That would all come later. I really just wanted to be telling jokes and making dumb videos, but while doing some surface level research to make sure some of my did you knows were actually accurate, I realized that there was a story behind the games' development that was just as interesting as the story in the games themselves. Some of it I already knew, some of it I didn't, and some of it put the kibosh on some long held ideas you see or hear throughout the community scuttlebutt and comment sections. I wanted to talk about that, as well as my own views on and experience with the series and its creators. But when you begin to analyze the creative process of other people while working on a creative work of your own, influences will inevitably begin to leak in. The story of Metal Gear, overall, is absolutely insane, and there are several conspiracies at work within the series. It felt only fitting that tracking something like that would be done on a full conspiracy board, but there are some other things about the series that I've noticed while working on my own, and when I'm finally ready to share my insights with you all in the fullness of time, you'll see I'm right and not crazy. This is actually the fourth iteration of the board as well, as the scope of the show and what I'm trying to track down has grown. I've needed to change everything from the size, to how the information is presented, to where the different pinpoints are laid out. Like you might have noticed in earlier episodes, I had little, like, info cards that I'd handwritten out and stuck next to things, but if you go back and watch those videos, it's really difficult to actually see what's written on them and they were taking up a lot of space and fuck me, they were taking a lot of time as well. And while the central idea developed, other things about the show changed around it too. For instance, I have the editor now whom I've been training for years now to work on these episodes. It's a long story about how the editor came onto the team. Oh, hey man. Have you seen my Mr. Mr. <laughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, I have my idea, direction, and motivation. Next comes the script. Sort of. It's not quite as straightforward, which I guess it wasn't for Kojima either. Metal Gear Rex. As you may have already gathered, Metal Gear Solid really did set a new standard for the industry in terms of cinematic presentation, and the script and character performances were no small part of that. Kojima did write the bulk of it, but another developer named Tomokazu Fukushima joined the project towards the end of the script writing process to write the voiceover script. Kojima specifically credits him with adding in some of the harsher terms and language, which considering Fukushima would then go on to write the script for Ghost Babble, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks to Tumblr blog The Arkan translating a 1998 article in Sony Magazine Japan, we even have Fukushima-san's thoughts on how the game presents its story. While the system employed by cinema and literature is closed to spectators, video games as a medium employ an open system that assumes interaction from the user. There seems to be a misunderstanding that the two systems can be fused when faced with the illusion of the realization of narrative, but since essential differences exist between them, their possible expressions differ 
differ, and on top of that, their effective crafts are also different. In Metal Gear Solid, we try to express things that are not only suitable for a video game, but can only be expressed in a video game. First of all, Fukushima-san of 1998 absolutely fucks with this statement. What he's essentially saying though is that film and literature are traditionally passive mediums, in that the story is already told and the audience is simply taking it in. What they do doesn't change the story or make it happen. Whereas in video games, the audience isn't just expected to interact with the elements that make the story work, it's an absolute requirement for them to do so in order to experience the story at all. This sort of interactive medium not only changes the way that you craft a story, but allows for ways of telling a story that can only be done in video games. At least right now in this vaguely modern era before we tear ourselves to pieces in a horrific display of violence and inhumanity. Man, I can't believe the fucking 90s are gonna be the peak of civilization. The example that he uses are the conversations that the player can have via codec when Nastasha and Master Miller are about nukes, the weaponry that you use, etc. And how all this stuff doesn't really have anything to do with the events of the game itself, it's all just tangential information, but rather than specific story beats that are supposed to move the plot along in an acceptable time frame, at that distance you won't be able to hit her with a standard weapon either. You'll need a sniper rifle, Colonel. Game stories aren't expected to fit into a feature length runtime. That means that the game can take its time on unnecessary things that, regardless, still help with world building, tone setting, and otherwise just adding to the experience of the game as a whole. In saying that, however, it's funny coming back to these interviews and reading them now with the benefit of hindsight because it really highlights the difference between where Kojima's head was at with Metal Gear Solid then and where his headspace shifted to by the end of the series. Like, in 1997, an interview, Kojima talks about how he thought that the cutscenes were so vital to be experienced by the player that he wanted to make them unskippable. And in that same interview he says, and I quote, The one thing I want to avoid though are those tedious scenes where characters are just blabbering at each other for four or five minutes. Okay, wait. Now start the clock. A new record! I mean, come on. How do you even joke about that? What are you supposed to say? Well, if he thinks that's short, I'd hate to see what he thinks a long cutscene is. Because that's fucking true! He does think that eight minutes is short. And the response to that anyway is Metal Gear Solid 4. Fukushima-san also wouldn't be the only one with influence over the game. Yoshi Shinkawa, the game's art director, was also responsible for some of the most important recurring themes throughout the games. His iconic art style influenced the appearance of the game, of course, and given the rough vision visuals of the PS1, it's probably the game that most closely recreates the visuals of Shinkawa's drawn designs, you know, because of all the He also designed the visual appearance of Rex, with the only rough directions from Kojima being that it should use the visual reference point of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and don't make it look like some robot from outer space, because I guess he wanted to save that for Zone of the Enders. Shinkawa even went as far as creating a physical model of the mech, which is almost identical to what would end up in the game. That's all impressive stuff and perhaps obvious expectations for an art director, but it kind of went a bit further than this. Even Kojima himself says, from a 1998 interview for PlayStation Magazine, from the very first plans I drafted, Shinkawa was in there changing things on his own. Ha 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 ha. This was my first time doing a development like this too. He'd come to me asking, what the heck is this thing? And then later, I'd find that he'd added something on his own. Uh, <laughs> he goes on to give an example of the cyborg ninja which Shinkawa drew because it's cool. Yes, yes it fucking is. What's kind of fucking crazy though is that Kojima's response implies that the cyborg ninja was inserted after the fact and later became the important character that he is. So, either Frank Yeager was always going to show up as some kind of psycho and the cyborg ninja just worked as something they could adapt to the character, or this massive plot point was created based entirely on some cool directionless artwork 
work that Shinkawa made. Either way, that's a surprising amount of influence on the project given Kojima's auto reputation. For Kojima's part when crafting the story, there was more than just the themes of war and nuclear holocaust that were driving him. Film and anime references, both direct and subtle, permeate the entire game, and I mean, how could it not when he was trying to breathe cinematic life into a medium that before that point had been very much... <laughs> Don't let him get away! Uh, not that. Unless you count the grindhouse ness of Resident Evil as cinematic, yeah, I guess you really couldn't get away from those comparisons sometimes, huh? For this, the kind of characters that he wanted were informed by the kind of story that he was telling. A more serious, adult story than most games that came before it, he wanted characters that would visually fit in that world. Hence, fatigues, and military outfits, and skin-tight sneaking suits, and Meryl in her skivvies, and whatever the fuck Mantis has going on, what he apparently didn't want were character designs that were dishonest, weird, or that are just meant to be visually stimulating, like female characters with huge busts. <laughs> I don't like those. I mean, aside from the very obvious with Meryl being half naked in that one scene and Wolf just generally being how she do, we'll fucking get to that. Also, unrelated to what I just mentioned, but immediately after Kojima attempts to misdirect from his perversion, it's mentioned that one of the original designs for Snake had him looking like Captain Future in bright orange. I need to see that design. Of course, finally, we get to the script localization and it's time to revisit the Blaustein issue. Albeit somewhat in brief since I already covered it in the previous episode. In that segment, I talked about the kind of changes that were made and why they might have been made and what their material impact was on the script in the end. Here, I want to talk a bit more about the politics of it all and how Blaustein ended up in the role. Let's take a step back and consider the context. At the time of Metal Gear Solid's release, Kojima was still a relative unknown in the West. You can cry about this being the case, but I think it's undeniable. He definitely had some fans and a following in the West for sure, but he wasn't the household name that he is today. The versions of Metal Gear that the West would have actually been familiar with weren't the games that Kojima had any involvement with. And of his two most other acclaimed titles up to this point, one version of Snatcher is still, to this day in 2024, trapped on the Sega Saturn, while the other versions and Police Norths never really got proper localizations at all. And I'm sure that has nothing to do with stuff like... <laughs> Blaustein, for his part, wasn't green behind the ears either. He did the scripting and voice directing for a few projects in his time with Konami, including, and I can't emphasize this enough... What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! Which is probably the reason why Kojima reached out to Blaustein about working on the localization for Metal Gear Solid's script. I can't, for the life of me, find anything where Kojima has publicly commented on the localization of Metal Gear Solid's script. Specifically the first game. We'll, we'll get to the other games another time. Moreover, I'm not even entirely sure where this rumor even came from, since I have as yet been unable to find a source of someone even mentioning that in passing. To reiterate what his writing process would have been like, Blaustein was working on this separately from Kojima's team. In a different time zone, during a time when the internet just wasn't what it currently is, and may not have been available to him at all really, with reference materials coming to him in the form of whatever media he could find at his local libraries, video or pagent. Even as Blaustein said himself from an interview back in March of 2012, that such a feat would normally have taken the work of a full team of people. Something he also notes is that, at that point, point, when you have so many people working on it, it passes through so many hands and begins to lose some of the flavour of the script. And yes, once again, translating is still a writing process. It's not just a simple act of swapping some words around. What those words say and how they carry the message are way more important than having strict one-for-one -one literal translations. I know that might ruffle some feathers because there's a sort of anti-localization community online, something about being as authentic to the original as possible or something, and to those people, if you are watching, I just want to say, I think you're a bunch of fucking weirdos and I really wish you'd piss off. And sure, it's easy to look back at Metal Gear Solid's perceived goofiness now and laugh at it because we're something like 20... 26... Jesus Christ, we're 26 years from the game's release, fucking hell. 
and that means we've seen leaps and bounds in the way writing and narrative in games is presented. In terms of cinematic presentation, for example, MGS seems downright quaint compared to something like The Last of Us, but The Last of Us arguably might not exist, at least not the way that it actually does right now, if MGS hadn't come first and broken ground. The English localization of Metal Gear Solid script is every bit as vital to that success as any other part of the game. See you in hell, Liquid. That's the other thing. It's not that I can't find any mention from Kojima about not liking the localized script, but that I can't find anything from him about it at all. About the only thing you could potentially point to as being damning is the fact that Kojima has words of praise for others in his team who have made changes to the game's designs a la Fukushima or Shinkawa, or that mystery female dev that Kojima didn't care to name for some reason, but hasn't said anything about Blaustein. And granted, that's not terribly surprising, considering and Kojima never really has a lot to say about the Western developers' stuff or talent on any of these games, unless they have star power attached, of course. But I never heard that before. Writing the script first requires me to play the game, which can sort of be a challenge in itself sometimes. I've said before that I emulate whatever I can, mostly for ease of recording. Save states are just a godsend when I just need to go back to one particular section for extra footage or something, or just, you know, for when I want to shoot Meryl again. Uh, how could you? Uh, why? Snake. Snake, what the hell? Are you trying to kill Meryl? You've gone insane! But let's say you have this one fucking game that was on hardware that wanted to be just so fucking special, but was too damn difficult to work with even for teams that were only making games exclusively for that platform, and the end result is that it's even more difficult to emulate with PC hardware 15 years after the fact. <laughs> you know, just... As an example, well, for those few games that can't be emulated, I have a capture card set up which is connected to older consoles. It's not often that I have to do this, I just can't be asked messing about with setting up hardware from up to five generations ago now whenever I want to play one of these games. I do actually own physical and or digital copies of all these games in case there was any kind of ethical quandary there for you, some of them multiple times as part of one collection or another, but if that's not enough to assuage your feelings, or misgivings about the use of emulation, then too bad, I don't care. I try to do this ahead of any kind of scripting or editing work, and I try to get as much of what I need all in one playthrough. This isn't the only time I'll play the game during the process though. Sometimes an idea I come up with later on as the series progresses requires me to go back and replay a segment to really sell that idea. What, you think I have everything perfectly planned from the start and know exactly what needs to be done? Have you seen how frequently I upload? If I have somehow given you the impression that this is all been planned from the start, then it can only be a testament to my growing skills as a writer, editor, and editor zombie slave trainer. That would be very kind of you as well, but to be clear, I generally only have the roughest ideas about where I'm taking this bullshit. See, even though at this point I won't have written a full script yet, I still try to keep in mind what kind of approach I'm taking to both how I play and how I'm going to cover the game. Likewise, even though I may not have written the script or played the game, I might still have an idea about what I want to do with it. For instance, when I started playing Metal Gear Solid, my original intent was actually to try for a big boss run, in part to dispel the rumor that I can't actually play stealth games the way you're supposed to because I'm trash, but at the beginning of the game while I was reacquainting myself and getting my feet wet so to speak, haha, ha, ha, it occurred to me that hyperconfidence in that direction is hard to build comedy off of, you know? And that's not really the point of the show, this isn't the completionist and I don't have a golf tournament. So at first I wrote a very rough treatment you might call Call it, where I effectively laid out how I thought the overall flow of these episodes was going to go. Sometimes with rough details, sometimes with fully formed script lines where I already knew where I wanted some parts to be presented. At this point, I wasn't really thinking about where I would be breaking the episodes up and it started to feel like a more coherent whole. Even with the sparse detail it had at that point, it was already too long for a standard episode as well. So I decided to do three videos. The first video would have been a long playthrough of the game where I gloss over a lot of the detail behind 
what's going on, focusing entirely on the events of the game itself. This was going to be somewhat reflective of how I first experienced the game as a kid, where everything was taken at face value with no larger context, nuance would have gone right over my head, that sort of stuff. I was also going to save Otacon and get the camo suit because when I first played this game and for the longest time after, I thought this was the canon ending, and it might still be. But we'll get to that another time. The second playthrough and video was going to be a bit shorter in overall length, but was going to go into the details and context of what happened in the game and how it connects to the rest of the series so far. This was also where the next snapping gag originated, as originally it was going to be me running around and camo doing that, resulting in a Spider-Man pointing meme once I got to the Cyborg Ninja fight, and this time I would save Meryl for the alternate ending, yes it's the alternate ending, shut up, and get the bandana and cover all the bases. Lastly, the third video and playthrough would be much shorter, alternating between the few stones left unturned in the game while focusing on the making of and behind the scenes stuff. I also would have been alternating between the tux and the camo, cosplaying as some kind of deranged bond predator hybrid, while occasionally breaking out into Rambo-like fits of rage with the bandana. Whatever the script would have called for, really. As excited as I was about this idea, it was clear that it was going to be way bigger than anything I'd done up to this point. Even like even bigger than what I've currently done now, and I wasn't sure I was going to even finish the whole thing before I just burned the hell out, let alone get it to a quality I really wanted. Like even at the planned lengths, the shortest video was still going to be a few hours, and I don't have the kind of HBG clout or following to get away with that yet. So, stripping back the scope and any elements of repeat playthroughs, I decided to still do one long video to cover things and treat it like an oversized movie. This would combine elements of all three ideas that I previously had, but with a presentation of the game as an action movie, within a YouTube video also styled as an action movie. Again though, this was going to have the same problem of length, even if I were to split it up. So, in the end, what was largely stopping me from doing any of these ideas was the time it would have taken to do them, and do them at a standard of quality that I was happy with, since the whole point initially was to figure out a way of being able to cover a much larger game with videos that were still relatively short. Obviously, we know how that worked out. That said, however, I would ironically probably be as close to finished on that as what I'd put out so far in the current format, but that also would have meant no content at all since... Fuck me, since I started Metal Gear Solid in like February of 2022? I mean, I also haven't put out an update on this series in particular since, like, October of last year or something. So, look, it's not like I have sponsors, alright? No, that's not what I mean. Get the fuck off my back. But also... Stay. So I'm still trying to come up with a concept for how I'm going to approach the game, watching the Metal Gear Solid briefing videos for maybe the first time ever, and I think to myself, wouldn't it be funny if we took the idea of dragging a grizzled, PTSD-inflicted veteran out of his self-determined retirement, which forces him back into extreme, emotionally charged combat, and just take that to its ultimate logical conclusion point? Like, hey Snake, wow, you look fucked. Anyway, we need you to come fight for us again, specifically against your old unit, and I know you haven't really spoken to humans properly for several years now by the sounds of it, but hold on to your last fraying nerves, but that unit is being led by what appears to be your clone. Don't argue now, there's no going back, we've already killed your dog, so get to it. Yeah, that's, that's gonna have some sort of effect, right? <laughs> So yeah, you get the idea. Hence, a long running joke is born out of overthinking the game's briefing before I've even started playing the game proper. Other times, it might work in the opposite direction, where I have an idea that I think will be great, and it might be, but then I get to the editing stage and realize it would take forever to actually do, and that's me saying that. I mean, I'll still do it. You have no idea how much time I spent on dumb visual gags that some of you have probably not even noticed. However, when we peer closely at the sausage construction, a lot of the time the final output is just a result of much iteration and midwork inspiration. I've changed the direction of this series several times already and sometimes that was done on a whim. It's just hard to tell for you, the audience, when it's all still a bunch of confused slurred garbage about old video games, harsh realities and personal traumas. But yeah, those sorts of grand ideas can cost time even if I don't actually end up doing them because I'll have recorded gameplay and made other efforts in that direction, like scripting or maybe messing around with 
editing possibilities, in those times I've had to work out how I can rewrite some things to still use and make sense of the footage I have with a different idea altogether, or otherwise go back and re-record some new footage from the games. I've generally gotten better at foreseeing the potential pitfalls that would go with some ideas and avoiding them in favour of something else. That's in part down to being capable of more things now than when I started, but also it's due to instilling better editing habits into the editor. This is the last time that I'm going to put up with muted audio segments and unbalanced volume. Use the audio panel! Watch the levels! Watch the levels! Narration at neg 10 decibels! Background music at neg 20 decibels! But also, you know, just experience with the overall process and what it takes to make certain ideas or effects work. Fortunately, because I've had a range of ideas, I'll equally have a range of footage that I can use because after recording everything, I'm left with a whole lot of video files. Sometimes as much as 127 fucking gig? That's actually not so bad, considering. Also, if you're wondering if these changes in the show's direction is the reason I seem to interchangeably address Snake as Snake, or as myself, or using the royal you, then no, that's just because I'm a hack writer. But what is that whole writing process actually like, I hear you ask? What am I doing? Well, writing isn't as glamorous as they portray it to be in movies or on TV. There's a reason why it's always shown as either a montage or in a scene where no actual writing takes place on screen. In fact, writing is a pretty solid banal process from an outsider's perspective. First of all, I'll have the gameplay video up on one screen and a script open up in the other. I don't even worry about formatting or convention at this point, I'm just pounding out my best ideas at the time and as many words as possible. As you can imagine, going through footage minute by minute with constant stops and playbacks can be pretty slow going. So, for a good long while, it's just a lot of back and forth between a couple of different windows while I bash out a draft. Yep, it's a long process to undertake, but rewarding, though there is a larger point to all of this. Riffs about what's happening on the screen is all well and good, but this is an MST3K. If we're talking episode by episode, then I'll have a certain point in the story that I'm trying to build towards so that the episode itself feels like a complete thing to watch, and not just the next one. If we're talking the series overall, then there are some larger points I'm trying to get at. One would be the development of the series, how it went down, and trying to dispel some of the weirder scuttlebutt around it all. And I guess part of the reason for all this would be because a deranged AI demanded it all of me so that I can discover the true canon of the series, and I still don't know what that actually means. And then there are some points about these videos themselves, but I'm not ready to share those just yet. But fuck stank, you stalling asshole. I hear you interjecting. How do you craft your comedy? You know, the strange series of noises you emit from the fuck awful flaps in your face that some people actually laugh at for some reason. Okay, so first of all, rude, hypothetical listener and or viewer, and secondly, great question. Believe it or not, I am something of a student of comedy. Aside from the shows and gigs I've been to throughout my years, I've even gone as far as undertaking workshops from some of the greatest living comedians, like Tim Ferguson. Wait, he is still alive, right? Fuck, I better finish this video before he fucking cocks it. Yes, I've studied, watched, and read various tomes and volumes on comedy, all in an effort to better understand what it is that makes a joke truly funny, and what it means to make other people laugh. So, if you want my secret, here it is. If it makes me laugh, it goes into the fucking video. No, really, that's it. Did you think I was making this for you? Why do you think I can go four months without an upload? Wait, six? What, what do you mean six? I I'm doing this to make me laugh, motherfuckers. Also, Lord Mortis and Dragoon, them too. Remember, gang, support the channel by subscribing and become a member of my coffee page by throwing some change in the jar, you merchant cunt. Quarter? Dar, he'll be shitposting for hours. You might be surprised to know, as well, that not everything makes it into an episode. I generally have a lot to say, you may have noticed, but sometimes I go off on tangents that aren't always relevant. Or maybe there are scraps of relevancy hidden among awful jokes that no one but me laughs at, and then after a while I stop laughing at. You know, this is the kind of thing that needs to be teased out from the rough, so to speak, and that's why we have drafts. But as you'll find is a recurring theme throughout this 
this episode and basically all of my work, time isn't something I have a whole lot of on the regular. And so I need to turn to the script editor. The script editor is a relatively recent addition to the Fox Tank team, only having been around since episode two of the Metal Gear Solid series. So that's like, what, a year and a half? The script editor is here to remove the chaff and really focus the script down to the bits that matter. They're able to do this because I deliberately keep them locked in a room devoid of food, water, or basic sustenance, any kinds of alternate entertainment, or human interaction of any kind, really. Basically anything that might distract them with their focus of editing scripts. Why don't you say hello to the people watching, script editor? <laughs> Once I have an edited down script, I'll do another pass to refine the wording of sections, make things flow a bit better, wipe off the blood, and sprinkle some more jokes in here and there. Now, this has all been kind of an evolving process since I started the show, but everything I just said up to now is more or less accurate for every game I've done so far. They were really just barely edited rants before, with the dumbest of visual gags to break things up. But as the games have gotten longer, I've had to write longer scripts if I wanted to keep the same level of detail on all the other weird shit I normally put in. Also, it's a lot of information to keep track of, which is why I started the board. But we'll get to that. The scripts I write now are formatted like a TV script might be, which gives gives me a better idea of how long each segment will end up being on the timeline. That way, when I'm ready to record, I can carefully dial the episode length into exactly whatever I fucking feel like. Seriously, I know the episodes are long, I don't give a shit about the fucking algorithm. <laughs> yeah, look, this isn't really what I wanted you to do, you know? But I... Like, I've been trying to work some stuff out lately. I think I can help both of us out. I just need to... I need you for something else. With the first draft done, I break it up into chapters at points that I think look reasonable until I actually get to them on the editing timeline with my recorded lines, but that comes later and we'll get to that tantrum. Metal Gear. A commonly repeated point of trivia is the reason that this isn't his real name, that isn't his real name, these aren't their real names, and that's not her real name, is because of actor politics. See, the story goes that at the time, the screen actor's guidelines on acting in video games weren't clear, and so the actors all performed under pseudonyms to get around these regulations. When I say the story goes, I mean that literally some version of those exact sentences are copied and pasted around various places on the internet and are vaguely talked about by some of the voice cast in various interviews, but otherwise the story gets told nearly verbatim over and over, with the sole source appearing to be a single unsourced screen rant listicle. Jesus fucking Christ, might as well be my Nintendo Uncle Daily. There is some speculation I can make here about what might have actually happened with the credits. Effectively, being part of the actors union, or any union really, is important in ensuring that you're not fucked over by the people that employ you in this capitalist hellscape under which we all labour. A part of ensuring that fair treatment is having set rates for actors' pay. If you want someone from the guild working on your project, you've got to pony up the minimum, at least, assuming they don't, you know, negotiate for anything higher. Back in the 90s, however, voice acting in video games wasn't exactly what it is right now. Die, monster. Yeah, yeah, you know, you get it. Voice actors weren't really actors per se, they were just, you know, whoever you had on hand, and often just being people who worked in the studio, or if you were lucky, like one of the five big names of voice acting at the time. But obviously, you know, this was a game that was much larger in scope and ambition than almost anything that had come before it, and so presumably, Kojima wanted talent to match. This meant reaching out for actual voice actors whom you might have guessed don't only do video games. Enter Jennifer Hale as Naomi Hunter. Paul Whiting as Colonel Campbell, Kim My Guest as Mei Ling, Renee Rodman as Nastasha Romanenko, Cam Clark as Master Miller, Debbie Mae West as Meryl Silverberg, Christopher Randolph as Hal Otacon Emmerich, Alan Lurie as Kenneth Baker, Greg Eagles as Danderson and Grey Fox, Patrick Zimmerman as Revolver Ocelot, Doug Stone as Psycho Mantis and Genome Soldier A, Peter Lurie as Vulcan Raven and Genome Soldier B, Tarsia Valenza as Sniper Wolf, and the computer voice from the VR missions that made me feel strange feelings I'd never felt before as a kid. 
Impressive sneak. Yeah, you know that one. Oh fuck, am I as bad as Ocelot? Wanna stay for the show? William Bassett as spoiler, Dean Schofield as Johnny Sasaki and enemy soldier, whatever that is. Maybe the dude in the tank? I don't know. Cam Clark as Liquid Snake, and finally, of course, David Hayter as Solid Motherfucking Snake. Hello. Everyone on this list would deserve a full episode devoted to talking about their background and work, not the least of which is Jennifer Hale, but for the purposes of this episode and the series in general, I'm really just going to be focusing on... What are you wearing? The reason I mentioned Jennifer Hale though is because, as David Hayter tells it, he owes the job to her. Yeah, he had to audition of course, they all did, but it was Hale that put him onto the gig. This wasn't just a favour from a friend though, Hayter had already put in the hard yards up to this point to warrant such a referral. With acting parts and voice work dating all the way back to the late 80s, he was already experienced in the biz. And I mean, how could he not be with parts like this? Don't you have something to say? Uh... Give me some skin, homie. Not really much, right? Humble beginnings though, I guess, and I mean, while it was less than 10 seconds, I'm sure YouTube will still bend me over for it. Here's just a weird little point of interest though. Some of Hayter's earliest roles were performed under a pseudonym, that being Sean Barker. Subtle. I guess Hayter really did love Guyver. So this is a pseudonym he'd used for a bunch of his earliest roles in voice acting, and even though I still can't find info as to why, it's interesting to note that this is still a pseudonym that he would continue to use for some time after doing his role as Snake in Metal Gear Solid. This includes his role as Arsene Lupin in the 2000 Madman redub of Castle of Cagliostro, which I'm gonna stop on for a moment because I think this is actually an interesting point of how information can easily be miscommunicated. First of all, it's a commonly circulated fact that David Hayter began acting at the age of nine, and it's worth noting for this that Hayter was born in 1969. Likewise, if you look at Hayter's IMDb credits, the earliest entry is from 1979, the original release year for Castle of Cagliostro. And if you look at the, just the credited names for his roles, it could be easy to mistake at a glance that perhaps Hayter's role in that film was actually as a Sean Barker, not performing as a Sean Barker. Furthermore, whenever you see the reported factoid of Hayter starting acting from the age of nine, it's never accompanied by a reference. It's not Hayter who began acting at age nine with a role as X in Y, just that he began acting at that age. Now with all this information at hand and without digging any deeper than what I've just laid out, it's easy to see how you might assume that perhaps little child Hayter, no wait, I'm not going with that one. Baby David. I could see how you'd think that Baby David had a role in Castle of Cagliostro way, way back. Obviously, it isn't. It was him doing the 2000 Madman redub as Lupin. Hayter himself has tweeted in the past that he began stage acting at the age of nine in a small local production. It's even something that's mentioned on his speakers page for that matter. And it must be something he's talked about even before this, because one of the earliest incarnations of his Wikipedia page from around 2007 added it into his biography though frustratingly without a source and between this and the screen rant thing and the number of dead links on the current incarnation of his page are all reasons why you shouldn't immediately trust everything on Wikipedia or any wiki for that matter and actually check the sources for what they say. Maybe I'm just making a bunch of assumptions here and making a mountain out of nothing, but I find it particularly interesting when considered alongside his pseudonym of Sean Barker. Clearly even a passing anecdote about small local plays can get swept up into the mythos about his actions acting career, and similarly, what people understand as being his reasons for not using a pseudonym for this game aren't as clear-cut as was thought. Like, I think the guidelines for acting in animation at that time were fairly clear, and if he'd gotten clearance for using his real name for the video game, then why continue using the pseudonym for the animation? Like, it just doesn't make sense, obviously there's more to the story, right? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, I just thought it was kind of interesting to speculate about. The point being that he was no slouch or amateur, a star he was not at that time, but a working actor nonetheless. It can't be denied, however, that at the time of Metal Gear Solid, while it may not have seemed like it then, it was by far and away the biggest and most impactful role of his career. Or maybe it did seem like it then. In at least one interview i found, Hayter has talked about how when he arrived at the recording studio, he was shown some of the gameplay and cinematics for the game. Based on that alone, and being a gamer himself, he said he knew then that it would be groundbreaking, though he didn't know it would become the sensation that it really is now. I didn't know it was going to be be what it was we just knew it was something really special especially david david just knew immediately said wow yeah this is this is 
We're in for a ride. As for the recording studio itself, it wasn't a studio, it was like a house, and it was barely that as well. As described not just by Hayter, but several of the voice actors and the voice director, the recording setup was kind of crappy and haphazardly thrown together, and the house itself was on a street corner with like a traffic light with no soundproofing to speak of either, and aside from having to stop whenever something would pass by. Every motorcycle, every car, every dog, Every, anything that made noise outside, we had to stop. And do it again. Apparently some of those ambient background noises can still be heard on the master tracks for the recordings of the original game, which was part of the reason for the re-recordings in Twin Snakes, but we'll get to that. Oh, this is just an aside to all of this, but Randolph originally auditioned for the role of Snake. You know, when he was done, Chris Zimmerman, the Western casting and voice director for the game, told him to wait while she fetched him the lines for Otacon to try out. And I went into the booth and I did my best at Snake, which... <laughs> I just, I just think that's really funny. I also can't overstate just how much voice acting royalty is on this list. And not just due to their notoriety for Metal Gear Solid. Seriously, look at the credits of these people. Going by the statistics of my channel, there's a decent chance that they are collectively responsible for a large portion of your childhood. The talent of these voice actors, and you know, voice actors in general as well, can't be looked past. When they're brought into the recording studio, it's unlikely that they'll be doing line recordings in the order that they appear in the game. While it wasn't the case for this game, with most of them being present in that Hollywood studio, it's also not uncommon for the actors to deliver their lines independently from the other actors on the game, even if those lines are part of a larger conversation. Hell, they don't even really get proper context for what they're saying. All of that comes entirely from the voice director who has all that context in their head and uses it to direct the actors into delivering the line in a way that works. But it is still the voice actors delivering those lines and doing so in a way that sounds convincing. Like, this is all kind of stuff that I already knew about how voice work is done for games, but I didn't realize the extent to how disjointed it all is. And yet, despite that, you still get the kind of performances so phenomenal, not just in their own time, but such that we're still talking about them nearly 30 years later. In that way, it's why I personally feel that it's really important to retain voice talent as long as possible in a long-running series where the same characters continue to appear. Not that that has any bearing on this game right now. Chris Zimmerman also really seems to be the unsung hero behind the voice cast of Metal Gear Solid. Aside from being the voice director, more than a few of those cast found their way to auditioning for those roles due to their personal connections to her. Patrick Zimmerman, as the name might suggest, was married to her at this point. Kim My Guest and Jennifer Hale were also known to Zimmerman for having been in her voice acting classes, through which Hale became friends with her and after one of those classes was when Zimmerman approached Guest about auditioning for Link. As Guest tells it in one of her interviews, I guess it was soon after her class she called me up and she was like, so can you do a Chinese accent? And I was like, no, oh, I don't know. Uh, how long do I have? <laughs> and she said, three days. And I was like, yes. On that accent, as its inclusion or disclusion, depending on which version of the game we're talking about, is somewhat controversial, the decision to include it seems to have come from Chris Zimmerman, but I'm not entirely sure as to why. In an interview with her and a separate interview with Blaustein, both mentioned how the scripts and documentation they received had margin notes, presumably inclusions from Kojima or Fukushima about how certain things should sound or be performed. It's possible that it's from these marginal notes that the Chinese accent characterization was found. As in that aforementioned interview with Chris Zimmerman, she mentioned how she didn't like that it was changed for Twin Snakes as she felt it was part of the character. This is all just speculation though based on circumstantial information because, as I said, it hasn't actually been directly clarified anywhere, at least nowhere I have read or listened to. So what does this all mean? Well, it means you have a bunch of actors who want to jump into a project where their involvement and pay falls under a very grey area, as the guild likely didn't have guidelines for acting in video games yet. Or, you know, at the very least, it might not have been clear on how they should be handled given it was a foreign company hiring them. Keep in mind, there are penalties for the actors themselves in consideration if they're caught operating outside of the guild's guidelines. Fines, maybe a little bloodletting, you know, it's Hollywood after all. So if you're in that position and you still want to take a job, which if you're a working voice actor in the late 90s, then yes, yes you do, then how would you get around this problem? That's right, change your name and work under a pseudonym. Some, obviously, were better than others, and then of course you have David Hayter out here with absolute balls of steel. Again though, I'm still just 
thinking out loud here because I have no real way of proving any of this. It's just my guess at the most likely and or plausible scenario. In that same vein though, the scuttlebutt as to why Hader didn't use a pseudonym for the game is that he clinched a nod of approval from the guild at the last second, though that sounds convenient to say the least. This episode isn't exhaustive about the game's development by any means, but one thing I have found in researching for this episode, for this whole series about the game in fact, there are a lot of stories both apocryphal and unsourced or half-truths or embellishments that are largely accepted to be gospel truth and thus colour the impressions the audience has of those involved, even though there's literally nothing to back them up. And that seems harmless until those embellishments lead to circulated stories about how Kojima actually hated the western localization of Metal Gear Solid, and that leads to maligning a guy who honestly should be celebrated, not just for the feat of work that he pulled off, but for the indelible mark that he left on a much beloved series. This is why I find a lot of the discussion around the history of Metal Gear's development to be so bizarre, and is really what I was getting at with the previous segment about Blaustein. This is why basically for this whole episode, all my speculation is clearly being described as such, and anything I've been saying as a certainty has had an accompanying quote with where it's from, and you can see all of my sources in the description. I mean, I also did that shit to cover my ass. Did you see that HBG video some months back? Fucking hell. As a creator, my question is why make three bad videos a week when you could make one half decent video every two weeks? No. Or fucking... one pretty good video every. Stop the question. Yeah. Honestly, if anything, and again, no way to confirm this, just a gut feeling if you will, but I'd almost be inclined at this point to say, at least at the time of its release, that Kojima couldn't have given a shit about the western release of the game. You don't hear a lot from the western voice cast about this either, or what it was like to work with Kojima, and the reason for that is... Um, I've never worked with Hideo Kojima. Like, Mr. Kojima, uh, he primarily works on the on the Japanese versions of the games, and when we were recording, occasionally he would come and visit or he'd show us, you know, cutscenes or whatever. But I, I never, he was never in the booth when we were working. Which makes a lot of sense, but also speaks to something else going on here. Keep in mind, this is Hideo, I'm an unapologetic cinephile Kajumbo, who has never passed up the opportunity to hang out with a celebrity talent who works on his projects. I had, I had dinner with him last night and his team and I, uh, that guy, like, he's he's such a genius, and uh, I'm just doing whatever he says, you know? And he's like, we're going to make people cry. I'm like, for a video game? And he's like, yep. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And then he goes, he goes, and I go, playing me? And he goes, no, they'll be you. And the same guy that talked about how he liked having a small team because it let him keep such a close eye on things. That Q&A session was from 2022, which means that after all the games he's worked on, Kojima never really took the time to work directly with David Hayter. Ironically, it's arguable that much of Hayter's notoriety is down to being Snake as well. So what gives as far as Metal Gear Solid 5 was concerned? Was Hayter just not a big enough star for him in the end? Did Kojima just really hate X-Men or something? I mean, I could understand that at least. Those movies were fucking terrible. Well, Last Stand was pretty good. Do you think love can bloom even on a battlefield? Yeah, I do. I think at any time. Next comes recording the script, and when I started, I was recording episodes in an open room, and that made it hard to replicate the same sound each time, because I didn't really know what I was doing. That's why my earliest episodes sounded like this. Which doesn't handle scrolling screens very well. Um... Uh-huh. When Kojima joined the company, he heard to work on- <laughs> funny. But also, ow, my ears. To try and fix this, for a while I was recording in here. It's a wardrobe that I pulled the door off of and lined with a soundproof foam with a little shelf installed that held the tablet that I read my scripts from. This made it much easier to make sure that audio levels of each recording were more consistent, but also made recording a pain in the fucking ass. See, the recording cupboard didn't allow me any way to control my machine while I was in there, which meant I couldn't stop the recording and roll it back if I flubbed a line. I had tried to finagle this with the editor. I hit the stop button. The stop... Yeah, that one. Press it. No, the stop button. Hit the stop button! 
Hit the stop button for fuck's sake. It's the big red one. Just press it. Press it. Fucking press the fucking button. But the training on that one was just taking a bit too long. What that meant was just having to hit record and go for gold, reading the whole script in one go, mistakes and all. Once I've recorded the episode, I've got a long audio file filled with some good takes among a bunch of bad ones and just so many terrible reads. I cut out the mistakes and the dead air, I fix the levels, which I then have to edit down to remove all the coughs and throat clearings and breaks between lines and the flubbed lines, make note of lines that I need to re-record, then do this whole process again for those, and then apply a filter that makes it sound more like my YouTube voice. However, now that the editor has a better handle on how to balance the audio levels, NOTHING SHOULD BE MUTED WHEN YOU RENDER! It's much simpler for me to just use this open air mic setup now, because I can have it set up right next to the machine as I record, letting me stop and start as I need to. That means that I can edit the audio on the fly, making minor fixes and adjustments, stopping the recording and removing outtakes as they occur, all of which which really reduce the amount of time spent editing overall. It's taken a while to get it set up properly into a standard I was happy with, in part because some things took a while to get hold of, also partly because a lot of the changes were incremental while I experimented with some things, and lastly because, well, we'll get to that. With those problems out of the way right now, the recording itself isn't a really long process, at most it might take a couple of hours. And when settling into a long recording session, one should come prepared. It helps to make sure that you're not going to completely destroy your throat, and few things serve that purpose better than insert bourbon of your choice here, because you can't destroy that which is already dead. So this, or something like it, is kind of essential to my process when you're going to be doing stuff like <laughs> Even if you're not planning on screeching like an idiot, talking non-stop for a few hours is enough to wear out any voice, which is why I take a swig before recording, and during recording. And maybe a few times. Now and then, I'll even change a few things in the script on the fly, because sometimes the things I write down make sense in my head at the time, and it's not until I try to say them out loud that I remember I'm a talentless hack. Recording itself isn't a really long prof- oh, Shit, um... The recording process doesn't take too long, maybe a few hours, now- <clears throat> Red Eagles as Danderson, and or plausible scenario. What was I even trying to say here? It's, just, it's just gibberish. Recording a script doesn't take a long time, maybe a few hours if I kept flubbing the fucking lines. What the fuck is kept? <coughs> <coughs> Record a fuck! Which is all just for my own audio, let alone anything else that goes into the episode, like, you know, the gameplay or anything else. And for all that, we need the editor. I think we're ready to begin. Nick. Nick. Nick! I have questions. I have questions, Nick! Age hasn't slowed you down one bit. Like I said earlier in the episode, much of what informed the development of this game were things that Kojima and his team were unable to do in the first few games. For instance, being able to switch into first person view just wasn't going to happen on the MSX, but was something that Kojima wanted in those original games and could actually be done on the PlayStation. Likewise, the way Snake crawls around and hides using the environment in Metal Gear Solid is just a more refined and immersive version of those same elements from those first few games. It all sounds really obvious to say now in this year of our Lord Korn 2024 that going from 2D to 3D would obviously allow you to do more with the same concepts. It shouldn't be understated, however, that simply shifting from a 2D plane to a 3D plane and maintaining the same game feel isn't as simple as you would think, less so in this earlier era of the industry when developing in 3D was first emerging. Admittedly though, it seems like some of this struggle was self-inflicted, as even in this early era of 3D gaming, Kojima was talking about having a very detail-oriented approach. In that 1998 PlayStation Magazine interview, he talks about how designing individual desks, workspaces, and surrounding architecture to appear just right for the setting is kind of a pain in the ass, and yeah, in the mid-90s, I'll bet it was. In other circumstances, though, it was about learning to adapt from old ways of thinking. This is where the LEGO building comes into things. It's something you hear a lot when Metal Gear Solid's development is mentioned that they design the 3D spaces using LEGO. What's often not said is that those spaces were usually designed in 2D first, but weren't really fit for 
purpose. And in that 1997 Famitsu interview, Kojima talks about how he had actually designed a bunch of areas as 2D layouts and graphing paper. Then, when testing in game and using the first person camera to view what Snake is viewing, they would run into problems. The example he gives is that a door that Snake needs to be able to see might be blocked by a column that wouldn't have been obvious when designing it as a 2D layer. Thus, when building it as a 3D space and then navigating it with a small camera, they could foresee those kinds of problems much more easily and adjust things by moving some building blocks around before spending much, much more time building a problematic space in the game and then having to rebuild later. What's not clear is whether or not they were using actual Lego or some kind of building brick adjacent. And after spending some time analyzing the picture and the colors in the photo, adjusting for color correction, then comparing them against what would have been available in Japan at the time, and with much careful consideration of all the information available from developer notes, I've concluded that I don't actually care. As a side note, one game fan interview article I've referenced a few times throughout this episode also starts out referring to this as a sequel to a much beloved NES classic, which might have been technically correct for what they knew of the series at the time, but I hate it. I hate it! When considering what's in the game as well, you may have noticed some subtle allusions from me about the similarities between this game and Metal Gear 2, the good one. By extension, I guess, also Metal Gear 1 as well. I mean, you've got a scientist kidnapped by an aggressive terrorist force based out of not a militarized fortress nation, but what could still at least be considered a militarized fortress, and then, you know, forced out scientists into developing advanced weapons technology so they can carry out some nefarious scheme, after which Solid Snake is sent in to take care of things. I mean, it's a tale as old as time. And sure, there are a few other things connecting all three games, but when you start getting into the specifics of those, it's more like easter eggs and traditions than weird sameness. Metal Gear 2, however, has a bunch of overlap with Metal Gear Solid, such as... Snake is brought out of retirement in both games, having retreated to some arctic wilderness or another after the previous mission. Campbell is still your XO for the mission, and an absolute pain in the ass that acts like Snake is an idiot that doesn't know how to soldier good. Meryl kind of encapsulates both Holly slash Hori and Gustava, being the female contact you meet on the base that goes undercover as an enemy soldier, has that cover blown at some point with Snake having to go rescue her, as well as being the one that Snake creeps on in the bathroom while she's changing. And I mean, depending on the choices that you make. There are the calls warning you about the mines in a field you're about to walk through from your number one fan that in both instances turned out to be Grey Fox. Grey Fox also does the same thing as Schneider, which is to say he was presumed dead in the previous game because, I mean, why wouldn't you assume that after you punched him until he exploded? And then after coming back from the dead, he does this as a ninja. Then of course you fight Grey Fox again, albeit this time sans mines. There's also the repeat of the Ultra Box fight, the updated version of the Hind D fight, and the Spiral Staircase chase as well. There's, you know, some other stuff too, which is spoiler territory for the series since we haven't gotten there yet. But I'm not doing another one of these making of videos like this for a long goddamn time now, because this shit took forever. So if you don't want spoilers for this nearly 30 year old video game, then skip to the mentioned time code below, I guess, then come back to this video at the end of the series and give it another watch in full to boost my traffic, fucker. Both games see one of the support people do a background check on another to reveal that they're not who they say they are. Though the twist this time is that the one doing the checking is actually the traitor. In the last few bits of both games, Snake receives a key made of a memory shape alloy that alters its shape when it changes in temperature. Both games also end with you not just fighting Metal Gear, but then having a fist fight with the pilot of that same Metal Gear afterwards, except now you're also on the Metal Gear while you're doing it and shirtless. Also, I guess Grey Fox bites it in both games, rip, and then both endings see a chase sequence where Snake and the love interest escape the base while being chased by enemy soldiers. You might be thinking to yourself, but fuck Snake, there are multiple endings where Snake can escape with either Meryl or Otacon. Which one are you talking about? And hypothetical viewer, let me tell you, I know what I said. This wasn't a complete list by any measure, just the ones I'd been keeping notes on as I noticed them while playing. Like, I'm sure there's more, but you probably get the point by now. The way Kojima describes it, a remake may have been consideration at one stage, but instead pivoted into a sequel that just did the things he wished he could do in the originals. Seeing Metal Gear Solid as more of a complete version, a Metal Gear that takes advantage of today's hardware. Or, you know, the hardware in 1998.
God, I wish it was still 1998. So when the devs did stuff like the SWAT team visit, that wasn't just a vague inspiration trip. The movement and intensity of the SWAT team members was something they tried to recreate in the guards' movements in-game, but of course with a little added flair so that the end result was something between realistic and Hollywood cool. But really, I think it might be more accurate to say that what Kojima really wanted was more of that Hollywood action vibe than the realism. Despite what he might have said about wanting things to feel real, this meant that a lot of earlier ideas has changed or were removed entirely so that the final product better fit the targeted style of an action film rather than the um grittiness of the Metal Gear that was to come. In one interview, Kojima talks about how the Cyborg Ninja would dodge bullets by jumping onto chairs that would then buckle under his weight, which wasn't really a thing in the final game, at least not quite in the way that he's describing. That same interview reported seeing Snake and Meryl firing their weapons back to back in some kind of lodge setting with polygonal moose heads on the wall, which honestly sounds like it may have been an earlier version of the Commander's Room. What Snake was able to do around this time changed as well, while it would be something that eventually made its way into the series later, Snake was also supposed to be able to hold soldiers up as early as this game. He'd then be able to either use them as bullet sponges while firing at other enemies, or just slit their throats if players so chose, but that was all taken out because it was deemed to be too violent. Snapping necks, of course, is much nicer anyway. Certainly cleaner, definitely less violent. From the sounds of things, however, the corridor that's chock-a-block full of corpses was always around throughout development, so that's good to know. I'm honestly here for this earlier, more bloodthirsty version of snake though. Ugh, no, not like that. To that end, in the same interview, he also mentioned that being flung away from an explosion might not be realistic, but it does look cool and cinematic. He supposedly laughs while he says it, but I'm unsure of how much he was actually joking when he says he was considering putting digital wires on the characters in game. Yeah, this is just my speculation based on what I've laid out, but I think what Kojima likely originally envisioned was a remake of either Metal Gear 1 or 2 through the lens of a Hollywood action movie. This is probably why serious tropes aside, there's so much overlap in the content and why Snake at the time seemed like he would have had more of an 80s action hero devil may care vibe with what sounds like would have been way more killing. And you know, that is something that he would eventually get around to doing in the series and so will we in this series, but well that's a long way off still. But the biggest thing that almost got cut was not Raiden's penis. Now that the narration audio for the episode is sorted out and ready to be edited into the timeline along with everything else, let me introduce you to Da Vinci Resolve. This is where all the magic happens, literally, it's in their name, and sometimes it feels like actual black magic to me because I barely know what half the shit does. So I think any editor, whether professionally trained or experienced amateurs, will tell you that one of the most important parts of editing is making sure you have a good workflow. And it's more than just the order that you do things in too, let me show you. Ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Fuck it, that's close enough. When I first started editing these episodes, audio and visual tracks were added purely on an as-needed basis, which is to say I need more than one thing happening at this point and can't just put it all on the same track here. So, yeah, my audio just had my narration, sound effects, and everything else just thrown in wherever there was space, and that goes for the video as well. Obviously, this makes proper sound balancing between your different audio sources a nightmare, if not outright impossible, and any filters or effects that would need to go on a layer would be done entirely bespoke for each clip. That's crazy. Don't do this. Unless, of course, you're doing a weird art house self-analysis film thing where you deconstruct your own processes alongside your subject matter for the purposes of entertainment and self-flagellation. In which case, get your own fucking thing. The smart thing to do here, obviously, is to separate out your tracks based on what they're being used for. One for narration, one for secondary narration, one for game audio, etc. The same thing goes for video tracks as well, you know, with some things being generalized and rules like the audio, but to be honest, it really depends on what you're actually doing. As an example, I always keep one track near the bottom set aside for just game footage, as I'm almost always going to be displaying this the same way across every episode. For exceptions to this, where I zoom in, have some kind of filter applied, or maybe just some other kind of effect, there's a secondary track above it just for that footage, so that it's not altered by other effects I put on that first layer. And then, for reasons so niche that I couldn't possibly recall one off the top of my head, and frankly, once I'm done with them, I kind of forget entirely what I did with them and just 
become kind of afraid to change them at all after that fact, and keep a third gameplay footage layer just in case. This all might sound obvious and in hindsight it is, but prior to these videos I didn't really have any video editing experience, and any time I needed to know how to do something I just turned to YouTube for the fun stuff at least. Otherwise I'm digging into the Black Magic forums and the stuff that you find in there is almost as frightening as the reasons that drove you into the steps in the first place. So even just how to go about the work is something I kind of learned for myself, and that obviously takes time, longer than if I'd been able to study or train in some professional capacity. Then of course there's the content itself, which I mean hopefully you've seen it for yourself at this stage, it's fairly involved. Some stuff that you might not expect to take much time at all end up being huge time sinks, and the things that you think would take a long time take way longer than that, and probably longer still than what they should for someone who wasn't a complete fraud. Now that I've figured out what each track is going to be used for, it's time to start dragging stuff into the timeline and laying it out. My entire first pass of the video will just be moving down the timeline and laying the narration audio out, and putting down accompanying game audio and footage that matches it. Maybe some title cards here and there for where I know I want the breaks to be. At the same time, I'll be dropping in markers for different things, like specific scenes that need to be inserted, effects that need to go in, bits of audio that need to be re-recorded, and so on and so forth. The second pass will be going back through and filling in the gaps with footage from the games, additional video and audio from other sources, images, and other assets used for gags and visual effects, etc. Most of the time, at this stage, I'm not actually putting any effects or anything on these unless I think it's really essential for something else. I'm really just trying to make sure I've got everything I need in there and that it's on the timeline where it's supposed to be. The third pass is then going through and actually doing something with all those inserted tags, making cuts, adding transitions and effects, animating what needs to be animated, and basically, you know, everything else that's required to make this a tad more visually interesting than just like a dull clip show. This pass, for reasons obvious, takes the longest, and the process for how I do this has changed quite a bit over time, so I'll just go into how it's currently put together. These days I have every scene broken into its own timeline rather than having the entire video in one massive timeline that I work out of. This is partly to help with the technical load, as trying to have what is effectively a full movie timeline on consumer grade hardware is sometimes just a little bit too much to ask of my PC. And it's also partly to help manage the overall workload, and chunk it out into more manageable sized bits. Once everything is complete, I'll render each of these chapters individually as their own clips, which then get put into a master timeline, and that all gets rendered together with the audio. The reason for doing this is twofold. One, the rendering thing that I mentioned before, you know, my machine just isn't up to the task, often failing partway through because of the sheer amount of shit that I'm asking it to do. I can only imagine the beast of a rig that Maxwell must wield to make the shit that he does. The second reason is really just a hair splitting of the first, which is that if there is a problem somewhere along the timeline that's going to cause the whole thing to stop from rendering, then narrowing down exactly what that problem is becomes a whole lot easier when the episode is already chunked out and I can do shorter test renders. These are all things I've done over time to improve how fast I work, but there's never enough time, you know? Everything I've just described is not a fast process, especially for one person on projects that started reaching feature length some time ago, and that's not even getting into the issues I constantly have either through problems with DaVinci or my own incompetence. That's why some time back I started enlisting help. You've already met the script editor. <laughs> But that's just one cog in the overall machine. There's someone else that you've probably seen on the channel up to this point that also bears some introduction. When I'm not able to bring myself to edit, maybe because I'm in a drunken stupor or just because I need to brood for hours or days at a time, I bring in the editor. Crafted and trained specifically for the purposes of audiovisual editing and nothing else, you never expect your first attempt to be so successful, but I'll be damned if this one wasn't a flu. You know, if it hadn't done so well, I might not have doubled down on the flawed design so soon and 50 more just like it might not have had to die so terribly. In the past it's helped out here and there with parts of previous episodes, but this will be the first test run of it being the sole editor of a video. All they've had to do is pass it the scripts and let it get to work. I'm pretty proud of the progress I've made with it, though I wish I could say the same for the others. Of course, there's probably someone you're missing. Someone you feel that I've left out of all of this. Well, you're right, of course. Ever since the days of covering Metal Gear 2, I've had a lingering ghast in the form of Nick hounding me whenever inconvenient and always ready to interject and 
point out my mistakes, the rascally little fucking asshole. Some of you have asked just who the hell he is, and honestly, I ask both myself and him that very same question every waking hour of the day. Some of you have even posited that Nick isn't even real, just a figment of a deranged mind that I throw in now and then for a cheap joke. But I promise you that nothing could be further from the truth. Believe me, I... I wish that were the case. But we're really pulling back the curtains here on Fox Tank, so without further ado, let me introduce you to... Nick! There is, I think, a mixed legacy of sorts around Metal Gear Solid 1. For a start, I think there's a problem of recognition of who worked on the game besides Kojima. Though this is before the days of stamping his name all over every little part of the game, and I do mean literally every part of Metal Gear Solid 5, you can already start to see the roots of that in these early days interviews. Sure, Kojima does talk about the contributions of other staff. His praise for Shinkawa's work and talking about how it directly influenced the project is the basis for my argument in defense of Blaustein's work and the influence that he had. But for all that, it's quite clear that when he's talking about the game generally, as worked on by him and his team, he very much regards it still as his game, not their game. Of course, the inspiration for the game did come from his childhood obsession with film and background in cinephilia, and I'm sure that he had a large sway over many, if not all, parts of the project. He was the director, after all, though you'd be surprised how little that can sometimes mean in other parts of the industry. The problem is that it still wasn't only Kojima working on it, and no matter how controlling a project lead can be, no game is the product of a single person's vision, as everyone brings their own influence to a project's execution. As someone who has done a group project can tell you, a single person can fuck everything up, but rarely does success come from a single person doing all the work. This isn't exclusively a Kojima problem, this is an auteur problem, and by extension, a games industry problem. One that's been around for a long time, and I honestly think it might be with us forever, for better or worse. He's certainly not the first, or worst, to ever wear the auto mantle, at any rate. Something I think worth noting, however, is one particular example from the 1998 PlayStation magazine. There's a part where Kojima references the same girl who did the police Nazi MPS, and while he says that she did an amazing job, he doesn't mention her by name or elaborate on her role and what she did in Metal Gear Solid. This kind of omission extends to the Western cast and crew as well. Blastein, of course, comes to mind upset as much that we can only speculate about what Kojima actually thought of it all because he hasn't said anything about it, and I think that still remains true to this day. I will say, however, that the heat of the internet was enough that Blaustein clearly felt the need to say something after all these years, or at least get it off his chest, so why hasn't Kojima said anything to confirm one way or the other, considering this furor was all ostensibly on his behalf? Again, we can only speculate as to an answer. Blaustein wasn't the only one that got the rough end of things in all this, though. Although, yeah, actually, he sort of was. We'll get to that in a minute. Jennifer Hale, industry alumni and sticker of mysterious fluids via her role as Naomi Hunter, was only paid about $1,200 for her role as the good doctor. This comes from Hale herself in a recent podcast she was on and doesn't elaborate on it too much further. However, this is kind of where my speculation about the guild restrictions from before comes into things. As a member of the guild, Hale's fee for that gig likely would have been much higher, or may have had other arrangements, like ongoing residuals. What it sounds like she got was a flat fee that wouldn't have had much room for negotiation. When you think about it though, Konami has been making bank on the back of Metal Gear Solid 1 ever since its initial release, not to mention the endless re-releases that came after. It's had like, what? three, four releases? How many of you bought the Master Collection, and that wasn't even a good collection? What kind of shitty collection makes me close the whole thing down just to switch games? The fucking thing can't even go back to its own collection menu once you launch the game proper. My point being that it's a lot of revenue that's been generated for Konami for like the last 30 years because, well, because they hold the license rights. That's it. There is a very good chance that the majority of the executive staff at Konami right now weren't even there at the time of the game's release, and yet, clearly, none of that money is going to the voice talent that helped give the game the kind of longevity that helps it to still sell some 20 years and change later, which I can only presume is the same for the dev staff as well. Again, this isn't unique to Konami or Metal Gear, but it sure is still a thing that's happening. I mean, look at David Hayter. He hasn't been in the Metal Gear Solid game since Metal Gear Solid 4, and he is still 
regarded as Snake by fans of the series, such as people's love for him. In fact, Hader has been doing voice work since the late 80s and has also been a writer, a director, and producer. He's had a very long career and worked on properties as big as X-Men. Seriously, that wasn't like a throwaway joke before that was complete nonsense. While he wasn't the only one to touch the script for the first X-Men movie, by the end of his edits, they were so extensive that he received the sole writing credit for it. But yet... I mean, you have to be a hardcore cinephile to know me from, know my name from screenwriting and then recognize my face. So mm. sometimes indus industry people in Hollywood will sometimes go, aren't you David Hayter, the, the filmmaker? And I'm like, yes, I am. And um, because even if they're asking about X-Men, they really want to hear about Snake. I mean, that's, that's just how it is. I 100% promise you that he is not still receiving money for any of those games, despite being the most recognizable and popular name for the series attached to them besides Kojima himself. Also, Jesus, look, I love Metal Gear, I love Snake, and David Hayter himself is no small part of that, but good lord, imagine having an entire career filled with notable achievements and accolades on some of the biggest cultural touchstones of the modern era, and then the only thing people seem to care about is a role you played in a video game series that you were unceremoniously turfed from at its zenith. After everything though, I think the worst part of Metal Gear's legacy might be some of its fans. You know, not everyone, not, not every person who likes Metal Gear, I'm not going to condemn an entire fan base. that's dumb. I'm talking about the loud, obnoxious, overly outspoken ones that have the weirdest and worst takes about Metal Gear and Kojima, generally based on nothing but hearsay and bullshit. I'm different, I have sources for my bullshit. It's not just the weird blind hero worship of Kojima's genius, but it's the weird lies that they spread. We could spend hours going through posts and comments across the internet, but this one I found from a reddit thread somehow manages to tie everything I've just said in the last few minutes into one hilariously stupid post while being exemplary of the rest. Also, I'm hiding the username for reasons that should be obvious because I'm not inviting anyone to go do anything based on things I say in these videos, so please keep that in mind. But also, understand that if you still do the kind of shit I talk about in this video in the comments of my channel, I'm still gonna call you out for it, especially after this video, because you will truly be the worst of us all, and nothing will ever help you be a better person. The reason they sounded and talked that way was because of one of the many changes to MGS1 made by the localization director. Kojima fired him because he changed so much dialogue, voices, things he intended for the game. The new localization director does things far more accurately to Kojima's vision, and has been with the series since MGS2. This includes twin snakes. <laughs> Oh, we'll fucking get to this. Basically, Mei Ling was never meant to have a Chinese stereotype attached to her. Naomi was never supposed to sound British. Kojima intended them to speak in perfect American English. Those were changes made by the localization director. He was removed because of this, amongst other changes. Now, if you've been listening at all to the rest of this episode, then I'm not entirely sure I need to viciously rip this apart, but I'm gonna, because no, another anonymous internet knobhead. While the script localization guy has done voice directing in the past, he didn't do that for this game, so it's not really his call on how the voice actors should sound. Also, the person doing localization almost certainly won't be the same person doing voice direction. Not just on this project, but basically on like any project. In fact, during one of the hater interviews I mentioned before, he talked about how ad-libbing or really changes of any kind to the script had to get approval from Kojima, meaning if they really felt like it it needed to be changed, then this had to be communicated back to Tokyo, and then they'd have to wait on a response. Had to stick to the script. If you changed a word, they had to call Tokyo and clear it with everybody. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it really became, you know, if there was something where I was like, you know, this line would be so much better if it was this, then we'd go through that process. But for the most part, um, I just did it as, as written. With that kind of attention to detail and close monitoring of what was going on, even if not physically there, I have serious doubts that Kojima would have had at least an idea of what was going in the script. So this idea that Blaustein somehow went rogue with the script long enough for it to get all the way through recording without Kojima knowing is kind of fucking absurd? That's the other thing you see a lot online, which is people being supremely and confidently incorrect in their assumptions about, like, 
like how literally anything happens in games development. You, the person watching this right now, likely have no fucking idea how games are made, even if you've watched a bunch of making of shit. Hell, even now, after everything I've said, I guarantee that I've likely not provided a fully accurate picture of what development was like, because that's not the kind of stuff that's publicly put forward by a studio. There is a whole theatre of politics and bureaucracy in play during the process by which the sausage is made. The people that make decisions likely aren't the people you think are making decisions. Things that are made poorly could have absolutely nothing to do with the quality of a particular developer's work, or even a team of developers, because there's so much more that goes into all that than just a plan is made and then it's executed. And so you end up with this absolutely stupid shit like the guy writing the script is making unilateral decisions about how the game should be changed and Kojima was just powerless to stop him, which people nod along to and then respond accordingly without ever thinking about how even on the surface that just sounds completely stupid. And look, I know some of you are thinking, haha, <laughs> reddit, haha, <laughs> as though you likely haven't spent a significant shameful amount of time on the site yourself, but when we're talking about the state of the community, this is the community. This is the discourse. It's not the entirety of it, reddit is hardly the only side of the internet, but this sort of stuff isn't an outlier. If you'll allow me to expound upon this idea a little more, and yes you will, this is my video, what are you gonna do, stop watching? <laughs> donate to my coffee page. There aren't a whole lot of media franchises of any kind that remained under a single creator. Fewer still that have maintained the level of quality that made them so popular in the first place. My point being that any successful series with longevity is going to go through multiple hands for that to happen. It's happening right now. Metal Gear Solid Delta is coming out soon, and Kojima hasn't been anywhere near that project. It is based on his original game, of course, and it's unclear if they've done any re-recordings or if they've remastered the original audio, but they're there are clearly some changes that are going to be made throughout the game itself, like it's baby steps towards the series continuing on in some capacity beyond remake. Perhaps it's doubtful that new entries not overseen by Kojima would be able to recreate his signature weirdness. But then again, Metal Gear Solid Revengeance exists, and it's amazing, and everyone loved it even though it completely cranked up the goofiness, and otherwise abandoned or made fun of so many established tropes of the series, and I think it accomplished that weirdness just fine. I think a lot of the outrage that exists over the idea of anyone besides Kojima overseeing the games, or basically anything that's happened to date, is the kind of storm in a teacup shit you see in any fandom. It seems serious because they're often the loudest, so they pull it attention to themselves a lot and speak with unearned confidence and authority over the series while saying factually and easily provably wrong things, because I guess maybe sometimes you'll think you're allowed to do that if you get the highest rank possible in all the games or something. You know, if your brain is fundamentally broken that is. The community is also full of people that would be willing to embrace change in the series because they already have. That's the other enduring legacy of the Metal Gear series, the rest of its fans. And far from spending their time spreading misinformation and taking that would be shitty even if what they were basing it on was accurate, they make really cool shit. Like this Gen Z meme thing by Parametric Avocado with the livesy doctor thing that I don't fully understand the context of, but which didn't stop me from watching it repeatedly, or the frankly incredible animations of Operation Intrude N313 by Mitchell Hammond, covering Snake's infiltration of the base and actually giving us an idea of what the TX-55 could have done, which looks awesome, especially considering it's straight from his imagination imagination, since it's not like the actual game even fucking tried. And then the countless video essays, fact dumps, theory crafting videos, and character analyses that span the entire breadth of the series, a la Diginer Gaming, Metal Gear Study, and... Halicon is there, I guess. A lot of the research for this video just wouldn't be possible without the likes of the Arkham, Shmuplations, and others providing translated promotional and interview materials from Japan at the time, and it's just there on the internet for everyone to read, and you should, because they do good work. In fact, some of the background music that you've been hearing throughout this episode has been fan-made tunes and remixes based on the game's OSTs noted throughout the episode as they start playing in the links in the description below, please go check them out, created by a whole bunch of talented musicians on YouTube and Milk Juice. For all the reasons I talk about in this episode and other episodes, Metal Gear is already great as a series. It has its highs and lows, like everything else, it isn't perfect, and it doesn't need to be. There are central themes and styles to the identity of Metal 
Metal Gear Solid that, over time, have transcended the purview of a single creator, not in spite of, but as a testament to their talent. We don't need to mythologize it by claiming Kojima is some kind of far-seen genius that can plan exactly for a series development and growth on the global stage in the 2010s from as far back as the late 80s. We don't need to vilify Blaustein or anyone else for supposedly introducing a goofiness that was likely already there and, frankly, is a pillar stone in the game's identity and a primary part of their appeal. Isn't it enough that the games are good on their own? Wednesdays and Thursdays were garbage day. <laughs> I know you all have a single burning question at this point, but fuck's sake, you still haven't explained why you go several months between uploads, you lazy fuck. Good point, hypothetical listener, whose criticisms I'm getting fucking sick of. The fuck do you think you are? Was your YouTube series comprised of what amounts to several short feature films and a severe disappointment to your parents? Okay, that's not quite fair. I know you're likely lazier than me, thus don't have the wherewithal to put on pants every day, let alone put a series together, I get it. No, seriously, I... I I get it. If you'll allow me to be uncharacteristically serious for a moment, I'll talk about some real life stuff, which is awful and disgusting, and I know, I'm sorry, after this I promise it won't happen again. Maybe. I, honestly, I'm kind of a mess. First of all, I do have a day job. Living, especially in 2024, is expensive as fuck, and I'm not exempt from that in any way. I don't think I have to explain to most of you the myriad of ways that this alone impacts a person's time, and not just for the time spent working. The result is that I've been burning out hard, and frankly, at the end of the day, working on these videos as much fun as they can be just isn't something I have the energy or motivation for. And despite several attempts to escape my circumstances, I just don't seem to be able to clinch it. This is just one thing in a series of personal problems that are wearing me the fuck down day by day, which I don't think is a problem unique to me at all, but it's certainly one that I don't think I'm mentally equipped to deal with anymore. To be very candid, I am mentally unwell. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's like, who would have guessed, right? But no, seriously, and yes, I understand that's a loaded phrase that you'd expect goes hand in hand with the hermitude I cultivate, but more specifically, I have PTSD which is characterized by major recurrent depression and panic disorder. Effectively, what that means is that I go through bouts of ups and downs. The highs can be incredible, and that's when you guys get uploads of only a couple of weeks in between, but the lows, well... How does this affect the output of the show? Well, if you've ever tackled depression yourself, then you probably already know. If not, then I'll do my best to describe things as I kind of experience them. First, when in the grips of a depressive episode, which is not a period of time with any kind of defined length, nor even an obvious beginning or end point, it can be hard to bring yourself to do anything. It's not just having a lack of motivation, but having some internal force that blocks you from even having the willpower to try stuff. You try to turn your efforts to something, even something you've ostensibly want to do, and your brain just refuses to do that thing so hard that it begins to manifest like physical repulsion. This isn't just for important stuff either, like dealing with finances or setting out house repairs, going to work, cleaning the house, making food, etc. But eventually you begin to feel that way about everything. At some point, you might find yourself sitting alone in a room doing nothing in particular and marveling at the fact that you've not only been doing it for hours at that point before noticing, but that it's not even the first time that it's happened this week. And you know, just trying to explain to people, people I know, people I work with, people I have to interact with at my worst points, why I'm having trouble holding a conversation or remembering things like a normal human being would without having to go into the history of why I'm like this is exhausting enough already. And that's just for the people I need to tell about it just to get by day by day. You might not think it either, given the general low quality of my output, but I'm sort of a flawed perfectionist, staring at the trees for an age while foregoing the forest entirely. By that, I mean I will spend stupid amounts of time on a single, usually small part of the video overall that mean a lot to me, and only me, and literally no one else, and then it's only once I've put something out that I'll realize I should have spent my time in other areas fixing up stuff like proper sound balancing, or, or remembering to unmute a section of dialogue, or being funny in a comedy video, you know, this is all part of the learning process and gets incorporated into my creative process overall, but with those flaws comes the crippling self doubt. Like, sure, I already know I'm a hack and a fraud, but I should still be able to pull off a funny sounds and light show about decades old video games, right? And there's just a bunch of other life shit that happens as well. Like
that stuff I just mentioned about the medication, that shit sucks. Last week, me and medication were starting to suck. There are some larger points to make about the series as a whole, but now isn't the time without the correct context. Obviously, I still think Metal Gear Solid was and is an incredible game for many reasons, as do many others, clearly, considering the enduring success and popularity of the franchise. That fact alone should put to bed any of the apocryphal stories around the game's development of a single visionary to whom the game's success is solely owed, or a sabotage carried out by rogue localizers. The games do have have a positive lasting legacy as well. The games themselves are still beloved classics and all signs point to a renewed lease on life for the franchise generally. It'll mean some changes, probably, though it would be hard to say exactly what, but I think there are more than enough fans in the audience that would be willing to embrace that kind of change if it means a continuation of the series. And I mean, come on, Kojima isn't coming back, for so many reasons, not the least of which being the terms on which he left with Konami. I just, I don't see things ever going back to the way they were, and if by some miracle it happens then I don't know I'll eat one of my editors but it's not gonna happen as far as my own channel goes what am I doing now well I still have Metal Gear Solid to finish off from there I'll be going over pretty much every game in the series things might change and how I cover them though like I said I'm doing this for me and I guess a select audience of acquaintances and patrons and how I do that is based on what I think will be entertaining to watch from that perspective the most common piece of feedback I get is that the videos are too long for the algorithm and that I should break them up so I can put things out more regularly. And... No, that's not how I do things. The episodes get progressively longer because the games become longer and more detailed, and I don't really want to sacrifice the way I cover stuff in this series for the sake of brevity. My theories are too important, no detail can be spared, but I want to cover other games as well. Maybe even the odd video about some kind of media that I obsess over? I don't know. My brain is broken and I need to make sure I don't so easily burn out on covering just this one thing. I've got some other scripts in the works that I hope to get to soon, which will see more regular content on the channel and feed the fuck awful beast that YouTube has become with its desire for constant uploads. It won't be Metal Gear, and it won't be nearly as long for each video, but it'll still feature the dulcet tones of my voice on a fairly regular basis. So, I'm sorry about that. Changing discs is a metaphor. How about you change this dick?